in respect of many of the issues that have been highlighted today. Um, there is, of course, a tendency in Fiji, whenever we talk about employer-employee relationships, uh, to be rather uh, emotional, but more importantly, I sort of take a dichotomous approach to it. The issue of industrial relations should be not be based on a dichotomous approach to the way that we manage that relationship. I mean, the very fact that Felix, who unfortunately has decided to leave, um, Felix said that, you know, I'm outnumbered, and I think somebody else said that you are outnumbered, basically goes to show that our mindset is very much stuck in the old industrialized ways of looking at relationships. It's what I call the 19th century way of looking at employer-employee relationships in 19th century factories in Manchester, which basically gave rise to trade unionism then. And of course, the reason why that happened was because there was a major social dislocation and upheaval when the Industrial Revolution set pace in uh, you know, 19th century England, because people left their farms, the whole social fabric changed, people started working in sweatshops, they were working with machines and new technology, that even the people who invented them did not know how they would function. People who are dying because of machines not working for properly, our limbs were being lost, etc. And of course, the whole notion of capital being moved across borders was a new phenomenon. So it is within that context that the trade union movement actually arose. And unfortunately, I think that in not just in Fiji, but a number of other countries, the whole basis of that mindset is still stuck with some trade unionists and even some employers. It's still stuck in their minds too. So there is a very antagonistic approach to the manner in which we deal with each other. And that is something that we need to move away from it. For uh, this government, uh, indeed since 2007, we believe that uh, employer-employee relationships should not be viewed that way. You see the political history in Fiji is that We've always seen in, um, in the past that certain governments were seen to be pro-worker. Certain governments were seen to be pro-business. So if this government got in, the workers would get screwed. Or if this government got in, the employers would get screwed, to put it bluntly. That was the way that we viewed the political landscape vis-a-vis -vis trade unionism. Our approach is that that should not happen, and indeed, all parties can benefit. A government's role is in fact to play a, if you like, intermediary role, is to provide the social justice where it does not occur, is to provide the laws where there are no laws to be able to, be able to address various lacunas in the law or in these very, various gaps within our social fabric uh, setup. So this is the role that government plays. Now, when, when you talk about government, this is the approach that we have got. The reality is what Felix actually failed to mention. I'm not here to bash Felix up. I like to bash a lot of employers up too, because the point is there are many employers who are not doing the right thing. As Howard Politini highlighted, we still have people paying people $1.50, when the minimum wage is $2.32. And mind you, again, this is what was failed to be mentioned by any of the other panelists, but the $2.32, the minister, I think, highlighted that, the $2.32 is for unskilled workers. There are eight different wages councils. They all have their own different minimum wage. We have electricians in Fiji today who are being paid $12 to $13 an hour because there's a shortage of good electricians, qualified electricians. There are people who are being paid a minimum wage of seven, eight, nine, ten, four, three, four dollars an hour. The $2.32 is for unskilled workers. So unskilled workers, minimum wage is $2.32. The fact that he was saying that for 30 years, you know, we've been saying this and we've been told it won't get it. Of course you got it. A few years ago, the Beni Marama government introduced minimum wages in Fiji. It started off at $2.00. It's gone up to $2.32. The Minister for Employment is on record saying that we are already carrying out a review. When the cabinet had approved the $2.32 minimum wage, it had said that it will again review the $2.32 wage increase, or the minimum wage. 
And this is again like I want to highlight, it's for unskilled workers. In the hotel industry, they don't pay $2.32. They're different rate, minimum wages. In fact, they pay more than that. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is the fact. Now, the other issue, of course, is the Constitution, as has been referred to, and I want to read this. Please uh, read this, because it is very important for you to understand the Constitution. Because unlike the previous Constitution, in Fiji now, the Bill of Rights has what they call a horizontal and vertical application of the rights. Previously, under the 1997 Constitution and the other Constitutions, the application of Bill of Rights was only what we call a vertical application. In other words, those rights were only enforceable against the state. So as an individual citizen of the country, you had the ability to enforce those rights against the state. When you have horizontal application of rights, it means that those rights are also now applicable or enforceable against other actors within the state. In other words, private companies. Individuals can take you to court for breach of Section 26 of the Constitution, unfair discrimination, directly or indirectly. They can take you to court for other matters also. So it does apply to you too. Your social clubs, there are some social clubs that don't allow women to go to the bar area. They no longer can do that if somebody were to take them to the court of law, because that is actually discrimination on the basis of gender. Under the previous constitution, clubs and associations were exempt. There's no such exemption anymore. So it is also very critically important for private actors to understand the extent of the application of the provision of the Bill of Rights in the 2013 Constitution. And the, um, sorry, can I have my glasses because I'm getting, it's just there on the side. Now, let me just read out two critical provisions of the Constitution that had been referred to and which is kind of within, uh, within this context. Right to economic participation, this is section 32. Every person has the right to full and free participation in the economic life of the state, which includes the right to choose their own work, trade, occupation, profession, or other means of livelihood. The state must take, subsection two, must take reasonable measures within its available resources to achieve the progressive realization of the rights recognized in subsection 1. Section 33 says, the state must take reasonable measures within its available resources to achieve the progressive realization of the right of every person to work and to just minimum wage. Now, these rights, of course, are rights that the individual can enforce against the state. And the burden of proof is on the state to actually say, well, yes, I am not able to do this because of X, Y, Z. And just very quickly, uh, I, I like to sort of say, say, tell this story to uh, non-lawyers. The uh, South African constitution has a right to basic health care, which we also have now. There's a very famous case, a case of Mr. Subramani in South Africa, who actually took the South African government to court because he needed access to kidney dialysis machine. And where he lived in that part of South Africa, there was no kidney dialysis machine available in the local health center or the hospital. So he said, you are breaching my fundamental right to have access to a kidney dialysis machine because that right is stated within the South African Constitution. The South African government's argument is, yes, we recognize that, but we are a, not a rich country. We cannot have a kidney dialysis machine in every health center, in every hospital. Because if we do do that, it may mean that we won't have enough money to provide drinking water to this part of South Africa, or we may not have enough money to provide you know, basic medicine services in other areas. So the, the court accepted that, but the court said, but it is still his right for you to give him access to a kidney dialysis machine, perhaps not in the location where he lives, 
but take him to somewhere where he should be able to access the kidney dialysis machine. So it all de uh, depends on the jurisprudence of that particular state. But this is just an example of what can happen. Now, I, I also, before I get into some of the specifics that have been highlighted, as I uh, spoke yesterday at the Fiji Institute of Accountants uh, gathering, and it's very funny because I was actually talking about uh, uh, Singapore, and I said, Singapore is not only inspirational for us, you know, Singapore is the size of the uni. Singapore is not only really inspirational for us, but it should become aspirational. We should aspire to become uh, what Singapore has done. The Fiji Times, thanks to Dixon Sito, who showed me the article on his phone, quotes me as saying, and he says, the AG said it was not only inspirational, but it should become expirational. I don't know who's about to expire. <laughs> but, but the point is, ladies and gentlemen, the, the, the reality is that, as I highlighted yesterday, that you know we are a population of less than 900,000 people, thereabouts, 890,000 people. We are the second largest country in the Southern Pacific, population base. The next largest is Papua New Guinea, which is about nearly 8 million. Australia is only less than 30 million. New Zealand is only 4.5 million. But if you're living in Mauritius, if you're living in Maldives, if you're living in some of those other countries, they are in a much better position than we. Why? Because they have access to very large markets and very short distance. Mauritius now has become the hub for ITC for many African countries. It's not very far off the African coast. Today, the world's best airlines, which other airlines are frightened of, come from city-states. Singapore, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, Qatar. These are city-states, but the airlines rule the airspace. American airlines are frightened of them. European airlines are frightened of them. Emirates has got the largest back order for Airbuses and uh, Boeings. What's the largest taxi company in the world today? Uber. Is the largest taxi company in the world today. It's the largest taxi company in the world today, but it does not own a single taxi. That is the irony of it. I just recently came back from US where they were advertising on television and the advertisement was targeted towards individuals who work normal day job, maybe accountants, maybe lawyers, could be an electrician, a bricklayer, asking them to become a driver for Uber. I don't know how many of you know how it works. It's a software application on the phone. You join Uber. I turn up at uh, LA airport, I want a taxi, I, dial the, I go into the Uber application, there are many people who have joined up on Uber, they have their own vehicles. Will the price of taxi fare come down? And it shows, when you have Uber, the price comes down. So what I'm trying to point out, ladies and gentlemen, we have to understand the global economic environment we operate in. We have to understand the technology that exists today in the world and that is affecting Fiji. When the housing market in USA crashes, it has an impact on us. When they do their calculation for $4 wage rate, do they take into account what the Honorable Minister said about free medicine? about subsidized bus fares, about subsidized electricity, free water, free medicine. Is that punctuated with the calculations? When we talk about wage rate increases, are we talking about job sustenance? And are we also talking about job creation? 69.6% of the total Fijian population is below the age of 40. 69.6% is below the age of 40. So it's not just creating jobs for a handful of people. You need to contextualize it. 
It's okay to make grand statements, but we have to look at the facts. And the retirement age of 55 is applicable only to civil servants, not to the private sector. There are many people in the private sector, many people in state-owned enterprises that actually employ people who are more than 55 years old. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the reality. Our task as a government, driven by the Constitution, driven by our demographic changes, is not to think up till tomorrow, but to think for the next 10, 15, 20 years. How did Singapore get to where it is today? Because they thought about where Singapore should be in 20, 30 years' time. Our GDP was higher than Singapore in the 1960s, even as in the early 80s. They're kicking us big time now. So what did they do and what did we didn't do? That's what we need to think about. I'm not saying that we have to be exactly like Singapore. In fact, we have many advantages over Singapore. Singapore buys its drinking water from Malaysia. When the Singaporean military, where is national subscription or national conscription is mandatory, every male adult who leaves high school has to go and spend one year in the Singapore Armed Forces. When they go and do the training, where do they go? They hire a jungle from Indonesia. They don't even have their own jungle to go and train. They bring water from across the border. They bring vegetables and fruits from across the border. There's about 2.5 million foreigners that live in Singapore to keep the Singapore economy alive because they don't necessarily have all the skill sets. That is the reality, but we're in a better, better position. We've got plenty of water. We've got plenty of land. We can, in fact, export agriculture. But the point being, ladies and gentlemen, and again, which was not told on the forum, we were told that you know, they have a very fantastic tripartite agreement, a very fantastic relationship between the government and the employers and the employees in Singapore. Lee Kuan Yew banned trade unions in the 1960s. He banned them outright. There were 60 strikes in one year. And he said, I've enough of this, you guys are all banned. Of course, 1960s is, compared to now is probably dark ages. But he banned them. And then he allowed them to be re-registered -re -re on his conditions. Till today, the government of Singapore funds trade union organizations. If I'm going to fund your organization, do you think there's a conflict? Of course there is. That's the story that is not told. And that is the reality of where they are today. If you talk to any Singaporean, do they go running off to any international organization about things like this? Of course not. They found homegrown solutions. And it is critical for us to understand that we need to look or have an eye on the big picture. We need to create jobs. We need to sustain jobs. I can tell you, before the ENIA came into place, which was not in place for decades, it was in place for, I think, about five years, and the ENIA only applied to government and state-owned enterprises, the only private sector people that were involved in it were banks. All the other single organizations that were fell within the purview of the ENI were the state-owned enterprises. 28% of workers in Fiji today are unionized. Where are most of those union people, the members? Mainly in government or state-owned enterprises? Completely accept the fact. Person in Lambasa is being exploited. People in retail shops may be exploited. People on construction sites may be employed, uh, exploited. Are the unions present there? Are they going and working the streets, looking at the garage shops? No, they're not. They are actually in what I call the very easy area of targeting state-owned enterprises. The banks came in because of National Bank of Fiji. And Howard will tell you, because National Bank of Fiji was owned by the government at that point in time. So it was easy to get into the banking system. But if you look, there is a marked absence of trade union activism in the private sector. 
and in areas where people actually are being exploited. This is why government has, in the budget, allocated more funding so the Minister for Employment can actually send more of his people out to look at where exploitation is taking place. We have to accept this fact. There is exploitation taking place. Just as there are sweatshops in downtown Sydney. Whether it is high in Fiji, that's something we have to ascertain. There are some unscrupulous employees. No doubt about that. Just yesterday, I was approached in Singapore, uh, Singapore, sorry, in, in, in Suva, by this gentleman, he said, my wife actually worked, has been working in a supermarket for the past four years. And the FNPF has not been paid for the past two years. And he said, I went and lodged a complaint with FNPF, and it's been seven months and they have not done anything about it. The employer has said, that, you know, you can go anywhere you like. But I will pay when the time is right because my cash flow was not good. There are situations like that. They do need to be addressed. The point is, though, and I think the question asked by the President uh, regarding, you know, minimum wage, what, how has that calculation come about? See, we have people who are negotiating, for example, Say four dollars. I remember I said to one of the trade union uh, members, I said, "How did you come up with four dollars?" She said, "Well, you know, I think it's a good figure. Uh, it does provide that, you know, base." But many of these people, for example, do not understand economics. This whole notion that FNPF must have on its board members people who are three or two from employers, three or two from employees three or two from government. This is not about representation. It's about running the largest financial institution in the country. You need to have the right expertise. The actuarials who did the report for FNPF said FNPF funds would finish by 2052. That's a fact. The rate at which we were disbursing funds that all the monies would have finished by 2052. So those of you in this room who are 25 years old, by the time you would have actually retired, you would not have any money in FNPF. Period. That's a fact. We have one of the highest rate of returns on a superannuation fund. Try going to Australia or New Zealand and putting your money in superannuation and expect a rate of 8% return. I worked in Australia, the rate of return we used to get was sometimes 1.5%, 2%. That is the reality, ladies and gentlemen. So you see, we have to put all of these things into context. We had people, I don't want to labor this FNPF issue, we had people who were being paid a rate of return of 25%. We had one trade unionist who was getting paid a rate of return of 19%. People were being paid different rates of return. The whole notion of superannuation is that if I save my own money individually, I actually won't be able to buy that big building. But if all of us pool our money together, we can buy maybe 10 buildings. So it's a shared risk. And when you have shared risk, you get shared rates of returns. Not only these two tables should get a rate of return of 25% and that should get 19%. And these people here get only 6%. No, it doesn't work that way. It's shared risk. And that was the issue with FNPF, and that's been resolved. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I think the other uh, point that I wanted to make, there are many people in Fiji. You see, as, as I said, the, we always tend to focus on what I call the formal sector of employment. There are so many people in Fiji who are not part of the formal sector. I stopped yesterday, I bought Kavika in Korovislo, I bought some bananas, I bought some coconuts. I talked to those ladies also. <coughs> sometimes they make $200 a week, sometimes they make $250 a week, sometimes they may make $50 a week. How will a not thought out well minimum wage affect them? They're self-employed. Will it have an impact on the price of goods and services they will buy? 
Will it affect their ability to maybe hire their nephew who may have dropped out of school and wants to join them in the business? Will they be taken to the employment court for not paying them $4 or $5, whatever the case may be? These are the critical issues we need to understand. There are many people, tens of thousands of people in Fiji who are employed informally in Fiji. So it's not only about those in the formal sector. We have to think about people in the informal sector. Those fishermen who go and catch fish, most of them don't have a tin number. Some may have a tin number. Some of them may be employing their nephews from the village to go and catch the fish. They maybe have a shared approach to the profits. They're not going to be affected by this $4 an hour. But it may have an impact on the cost of fuel. It may have an impact on the cost of boat repairs. I'm not saying, I'm not arguing, ladies and gentlemen, for a non-increase in the minimum wage. And let me tell you again, and unfortunately the media also does not highlight this, the minimum wage we talked about, we talk about is for unskilled workers. Skilled workers, those who are caught by the Wages Council, they have a completely different rate of minimum wage. This is something that has not happened in Fiji before and that is minimum wage for unskilled people. I think, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the other uh, point that I wanted to highlight is that... So I've kind of lost my thought. I think, uh, you know, I wanted to also set the record as far as uh, government is concerned. Yes, government is one of the larger employers. Uh, there's something like about 28,000 people who are on government's payroll. Uh, the fact is that we recently had discussions a few months back with the public sector unions. There's a confederation of public sector unions led by Rajeshwar Singh. We've had meetings with them. We've given them a brief on the uh, public service reforms. We've also said to them that we are carrying out an assessment of the wage rates being paid to government workers, government employees. And we're carrying it out. And that is very critical. You've already seen a recognition of that. For example, the doctors have received up to about an 80% wage increase. An 80% wage increase is completely unheard of in the public sector. But it has happened. And it has happened for a specific reason. And very much it was required. Ladies and gentlemen, today, if any one of you, including myself, have a heart attack now, there's nobody in Fiji that can carry out an open heart surgery on any one of you. That's a tragedy. And you cannot turn out or create an open heart surgery specialist overnight. It takes 10, 15 years of training and investment in your human resources. A plan. 10, 15 years out. That's what's required. So there are many areas that we lack in. I knew only a few years ago there's only one lady who is a speech therapist in Fiji. Many of our children may have some impediment with their speech when they're young kids. But it could be fixed up. Because, but if they don't have access to them, we will condemn them to be somebody who speaks funny. We will not realize their true potential as an individual Fijian who can contribute to the economic well-being, not just for themselves and for their family, but also to the country. So there are many areas in which we lack specialization, many areas that we need to build up to make our economy even more attractive. When we try recently, I was told by Fiji Airways that Coca-Cola wanted to have its, one of its largest conferences and come to Fiji. They did not come to Fiji because they wanted somebody who can carry out open heart surgery on call. They wanted super duper medical services on standby. So they won't come to Fiji. It's an economic opportunity that is lost. So my point being, ladies and gentlemen, when we talk about the economy, when we talk about our future, we need to take a holistic approach to the economy. 
We need to understand how the clocks fit in. We cannot be parochial. You cannot be narrow-minded and just say, oh, this is it. This is all I want. I think George Samasoni there. We are putting a, a pipeline out of the Southern Cross cable connectivity that's going to come from uh, Samoa. Samoa is going to connect to Batuanga, and that cable is coming between Tavuni and Savasau, and government has decided to, at the cost of, I think, about 7 million US, build a pipe out of that to have it land on Savasau to get Vanua Levu connected. Why are we doing that? When 65% of the total population, Fijian population, lives on Viti Levu. Why? Because we want the people of Vanua Levu to be able to not just have access to the services, but to be able to participate in the economic opportunities that will arise from being connected to technology. We want a lot of the Vanua Levu people to stay in Vanua Levu. <laughs> That's the environment. It will create jobs. Hopefully the guy who's paying $1.50 to the security guard will stop doing that. Because one of the reasons why people do do that and employees exploit the situation when there's less economic opportunities for people. So now the guy is hungry for a job. So let's see how best we can screw them. And please, as Howard highlighted, the point is that you also have a corporate responsibility to ensure that every single person in Fiji, every single employer in Fiji, does not exploit the employees in this country. It's very critical. Because you see, the more you allow that to happen, the more wind you'll be giving to those who are riding on this sort of very emotional lines of saying everybody's being exploited in the country. You cannot simply say, well, I'm not doing it. My company is really great. We look after my workers. Yeah, but what about the person down the road? So it is your responsibility. In the same way as we've highlighted previously, and I like to reiterate this all the time, and I've said this in many forums, domestic violence is an issue for all of you. You are in this hotel. Most of the people who clean your room, who clean your toilet, who wait for you in the restaurant, who are helping out probably in the kitchen, who wait for you when you pay your bill, are women. If they are being bashed up the night before at home or wherever, what do you think will be the level of absenteeism? What do you think will be the level of productivity? Would they want to come to work because they've got a black eye? Will they be able to sweep the floor better because their body is aching from the beating they've got the night before? So the reality is that we have to understand that there is no such thing as a division between the public and the private. In the same way as the Honorable Prime Minister keeps on talking about persons with disabilities. The budget consultations. I met a gentleman who's, who can only speak through sign language, he cannot speak well. He works for printing press, I think a printing press, in Lotoka. He was being paid a third of the salary what everybody else is getting for doing exactly the same work. When he gets sick, they said, we're not going to pay you sick leave. But he's doing the same job. There's absolutely no detraction in terms of his output, his level of productivity. This is why we've given a 300% tax rebate for anybody who employs a disabled person to encourage people to get them to know that, look, even if you want to be very much focused on finance, you are probably missing out on a very good worker whose productivity may be very good. So ladies and gentlemen, the point is this, that when we have these discussions, we need to adopt a new way of thinking. We should not see ourselves as antagonistic partners in this sort of relationship. But we also need to be able to deal with facts. In the same way as we continuously say to FERCA, the people who go out and audit, they must understand what is gearing. They must understand how to read a balance sheet, how to read the, the, know the difference between a balance sheet and a cash flow statement. 
In the same way, a trade unionist must also understand the points of difference in these things. You simply cannot say, oh, they've been making a $20 million profit, therefore there's plenty of money. As somebody said in Parliament the other day, oh, Fiji Airways has made $65 million profit, so therefore it must be, everything must be hunky-dory. Of course not. It goes to show and demonstrate a lack of understanding of finances. So to be able to participate as partners and have meaningful discussions, we need everybody to be able to understand the fundamentals of what we are talking about. And that is very, very important. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I um, probably would like to round up there. Um, and I know there's issues about uh, various other things we talked about, various decrees and laws, etc. But, you know, uh, I can tell you that uh, um, it's become more of a cliched sort of reference uh, than anything else. Uh, the reality is we need to look at the practical implication of that. The reality is also we need to be able to understand what are some of the issues that we have to deal as a developing country. And we've also said that with time to come, there are many changes that will take place. The, the other last point I'd like to make, ladies and gentlemen, is there is, for example, and again I'd like to reiterate this, with the 13 technical colleges that have been set up, uh, it is to address the shortage of semi-skill sets, semi-trades people, specialized trades people, there's a shortage of that. We have two construction companies in Fiji that have already brought workers from Philippines and Indonesia. The people who are laying the tiles at Nandi Airport with the 120 million odd dollar renovation are, are Samoans. Um, the New Zealand company has brought them over because he could not find anybody as good as they are. That's the reality. I was, uh, about four weeks ago, I went up to the uh, Naranga Novosa Technical College up in Duvu, and the head teacher there was telling me that many of the students who have started their first term and the second term they go out and actually do their practicals, after the practicals they're actually not coming back because it's such a huge demand for them. We hope that they will come back and finish the certificates. But the point is there's a lot of opportunities in those areas, and we need to harness those opportunities. And the point that I'd like to make to you, please, is one thing if you can take away from this, is that we need to start thinking outside the box. And as I said yesterday, that whenever we talk about economic issues pertaining to Fiji, we need to take a very apolitical approach to it. We need to take a very non-personalized approach to it. There are certain areas of what should be taboo or tambu to talk about, or politicize, I should say, not to talk about, but to stop politicizing it. We are a small country, I want to get back to that. There are many economic challenges that we do face. We were very lucky, ladies and gentlemen, that Cyclone Winston did not actually come through Suva and Nasunu and Nasori and Lamy, a third of our population lives there. Manufacturing base is there. All these people are building beds, mattresses, all sorts of things. Fish companies, tin fish companies, all sorts of factories. And if it went on the path they said it would continue on, which is hitting Suva, going through the middle of Viti Levu, smack on hitting Denarau, where do you think we would be today? You can have one climatic event that can set you back 30 years, 40 years. That is the situation we need to understand. That is the situation employees need to understand, employees need to understand, and of course government understands that. So we need to diversify our economic base. It is always a good risk position to be in. In the same way, today 67% of our tourism arrivals come from Australia and New Zealand. 51% from Australia, about 16% from New Zealand. If they have a massive economic downturn, what do you think will happen to us? So isn't it better for us as a government, as an industry, to diversify that risk? Grow the numbers, but have lower percentages from different countries. In the same way, 
Our economic diversification is very critical. That if your tourism sector gets affected, you have other areas. You have ITC. Hopefully soon we'll have medical services. We have other areas of being a transshipment hub of the Pacific. These are the reasons why we're investing in infrastructure. But these are the reasons what we need to be cognizant of whenever we talk about economic opportunities in Fiji, whenever we talk about labor relations in Fiji. Today, the garment industry is getting buoyed. We used to employ 22,000 people. We have, you know, easier market access to uh, USA. We're not going to start making, you know, 100,000 shirts of one print. We're not in that space anymore. Kalpe Solanki and them will tell you that they're making specialized garments now. Small orders, but specialized, higher quality, better quality. Make 300 tops, some female tops, put it on the plane, doesn't get warehouse, goes straight to the retail shop. That's the attraction of Fiji. That's what we should capitalize on. They were down to 3,500 workers. Today we are about 7,000 workers, more. So it's a good space to be in. So we have to recognize our niche. And in recognizing our niche, ladies and gentlemen, we need to continuously reiterate that. We must employ the best people for the right jobs. Must be based on merit. Because it is very critical. Because then you have a better return for your shareholders. You get better dividend payouts. And it's better return for the country as a whole. So it is very critical for us to be nationalistic about our, about our economic position. And if we are able to focus on those areas and bring facts to the table to talk and discuss, we'll be in much better space in the years to come. Thank you very much for the time and thank you very much for the opportunity.